wherever in the world you are. I'm honored to open this book event develop, uh, devoted to uh, Central Peripheries by Dr. Malen Laruel here in the Elliott School of International Affairs. I'm Peter Holberg, Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Research Initiatives in the Elliott School. And this event is part of the celebration of 30 years of independence of Central Asia. But allow me first to say a few words about the Institute that hosts our Central Asia program. And there's a reason for that. Uh, the Institute for European Russian Eurasian Studies, IRIES, uh, because both the Central Asia program and IRIES are directed by Marlene Laurel, the author of the book that we are launching today. And our institute also hosted two of our three discussants as research fellows um, in the past few years. Uh, I want to say just about the situation in which we are now. The last year and a half were a trying period for our school and thus for the Central Asia program and for IRIES as well reflecting the tumultuous conditions under which institutions of higher learning had to operate throughout the world. The beginning of the health crisis resulted in a hiring freeze and in deep budgetary restrictions, bringing most operations to a sudden halt. Paradoxically, researchers reacted to the year-long lockdown, uh, not with depression, uh, but with heightened activities, increasing the number of grant applications in our school alone by 60%. And that includes also the scholars in IRIES, including Malen Laurel, who actually applied for a large number of grants and won also uh, an amazing number of grants in this difficult period. In all of this, the research institutes played the role of a vanguard and IRIES with its Central Asia program as its integral part is exemplary in these countless initiatives. One of the former IRIES directors, Jim Millar, was distrustful of the longevity of institutes. He used to say, institutes come and go, departments are forever. Well, in my 30 years at UW, I've seen departments disappear, yet IRIES is still there, celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. As a matter of fact, IRIES is the only institute in the Elliott School that has been ranked by McGann as a leader among university affiliated regional study institutes beginning in 2017 with rank six in the world and moving up last year to number five, higher than any of its peers in the United States. There can be no doubt that the Central Asia program with its numerous colloquia and publications is a major contributor to this success. In its 10 year history at George Washington University, the Central Asia program has become a hub of intellectual production and a genuine partner for scholars in the Central Asia Republics. The book Central Peripheries published by UCL Press offers new perspective, perspectives on the complexities of nation building in Central Asia's post-Soviet republics. Its author, Malan Laurel, is one of the world's leading experts on Central Asia. Although the range of her expertise includes other fields as well, her books, for example, the recently published Is Russia Fascist, are distinguished by innovative approaches, objectivity, and independence of view. Thus, they trigger fruitful debates that transcend the convenient cliches that are common in mass media and that are typically a characteristic of academia. Our three discussants exemplify the internationalization, one might even say globalization of scholarship in Central Asia in an impressive manner. Diana Kuderbegenova is a lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. Sabina Insibayeva is assistant professor in the Graduate School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Tsukuba in Japan. And Berik Boldukiev is a PhD candidate in, a candidate in political science and international relations at the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies at the Australian National University. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to our guests. I now give the floor to Marlene Laurel. Thank you so much, Peter, for your kind introduction. What I would like to do here is very briefly over like a few minutes, give you a, a, a brief summary or a, a, a brief yes, yeah, summary of the approaches that I was trying to develop in, in the book. In fact, it's a compilation of articles that I've been publishing all over the last two decades. And I've tried to kind of update and tie them uh, uh, together. And they are really the result of, so this kind of 20, 25 years of studying Central Asia and following the evolution of the region, but also of my interest in uh, nationalism studies and everything related to ideological construction. And there are two key elements that have drove my, my interest for nationhood in, in Central Asia. The first one is that I see 
a limitation in the way we have been studying authoritarianism in Central Asia, because we usually miss the part of consensus that is needed for citizens to accept and function in a resilient manner with an authoritarian regime. And I think this resilience and acceptance and consensus is very much possible because the Central Asian state have been able to produce and to perform the nation and its symbolic attributes in ways that was speaking uh, uh, to a large segment of the population. And that kind of consolidated the kind of co-creational relationship between the state and the, the citizens around the symbolic definition of the nation. And so I see this book also as a contribution to regime studies by saying like, let's also look at nationhood as a critical element of the symbolic politics that make regimes possible in, in a, a especially, I mean, authoritarian regimes possible. The second element is that I was really intrigued by what seems to be a, an, a paradox of having on one side a Central Asia as being highly globalized. I mean, Central Asian elites are globalized, flows of money and trade are globalized, societies, everyday citizens are living in very transnational spaces. So we have this globalized aspect. <clears throat> and at the same time, the region is still holding a very old fashioned vision of what should be the nation state and what are the symbolic attributes of the nation state. And I think that's, that has a really interesting paradox and some have been bringing that notion of post postmodernism, that is a kind of new wave of refusal of postmodern relativism and Western produced narrative about the death of the, the nation. And on the contrary, and I think that's what the Central Asian state have been uh, uh, doing, rehabilitating nationhood and nationalism as a path to universalism. It's through your nation state that you integrate the international community. It's through your symbolic kind of national attributes that you create your voice in the world, that you speak to your international community, that you get recognized, that you get a brand. So it's a very 19th century German romanticism inspired uh, uh, definition of the nation as a path to universalism. And I think Central Asia is a good example that encapsulates this combination of being globalized and postmodern in many eclectic aspects, but also very traditional in the, the value portfolio that is brought together. And I think that explains very much why the region was feeling or is still feeling quite at ease with illiberal movement and leaders that are uh, arriving in the West because illiberal movements are insisting on recreating political social and cultural boundaries and sometimes concrete borders, but also cultural boundaries. And I think that's something that in Central Asia is received quite well, because as I was saying, nationalism is seen as a tool for gaining agency. And so it's normal to have borders, to have an in-group and an out-group and to have a, 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 a quite a, a well-defined boundaries of who is in, who is out. So that's what the kind of two broad uh, uh, element that uh, uh, pushed me to put all these articles together and try to reflect on these nationhood processes. Uh, the book itself uh, uh, really focuses on much more concrete nationhood trajectories and what I call the national biography. And so I looked at four of the five Central Asian countries. I'm not looking at Turkmenistan because it was, of course, it's too difficult to do research and to bring something new to what has already been written. And I really focus mostly on, on Kazakhstan, but I also have chapters on Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, looking at the different aspects of the rewriting of history. How do you discuss ethnic continuity? How do you discuss globally historical continuity? Which period of history do you want to celebrate? Which one do you want to obscure? How do you deal with your territorial unity? How do you deal with the Soviet past and what is rooted in the Soviet past and what you want to reconstruct. And of course, one of the big unsaid in all these uh, 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 national uh, uh, biographies is the relationship to Islam, which I think is a key element that we <laughs> should more often say that it's the big absent of this kind of national official uh, 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 history. So what I was interesting is really looking at this ambivalence of nationhood as a so defining the new cultural normality or normalcy for the post-Soviet period, it's an 
it's a mismaking process to create what will be what would make sense for everyday citizens, right? For kind of the, the commonsensical process. And at the same time, nationhood or nationalism is a technology of power. So it's a way to develop non-democratic, non-representative mechanism where the society can still feel that they have something to say or to incorporate. So I was interested in that uh, uh, nationhood being both normative co-creational, but it can also be repressive depending on, of course, the countries. You look at the period and the, the, the lens you want to, to look at. What I think, and I will be uh, slowly moving toward the, the conclusion, what I think was is really important is that we have been looking at the region too much through a very normative Western-centric lenses, looking at and seeing Central Asian state as very static, stagnant, immobile, and I think, in fact, when you look at the nationhood process, you see them as very inventive, creative, really playing with a lot of different tools to try to create something that would make sense, right, to the population. And it's not only about text, it's about architecture, it's about museology, it's about visual, it's about pop culture. And so in the conclusion, I tried to show these new venues for research. And in fact, there are a lot of great research produced now. It's really a, a blossoming uh, uh, filled with a lot of new scholars looking at that on all the non-textual form of writing national history. And it could be uh, memory, oral history, popular history, television, uh, uh, art, street art, music. And so I think it's really interesting in that what I'm, on what I'm concluding in the book is that for three years, for three decades, the Central Asian production of nationhood was quite centralized by the state and kind of classic institutions. And what we see emerging this last decade is really a more plural rewriting of history, a less consensual, a less state-centric. And so we can see tension emerging in the way different groups are trying to produce a narrative about the nation. And so they are more of this co-creational mechanism arriving now. And I think that's a sign that plurality is on its way in Central Asia, ideological plurality in reinterpreting the past and deciding what is meaningful for the nation is on its way in Central Asia. So maybe it's not necessarily there politically, well, it can be in Kyrgyzstan, but not necessarily in the other. But I think in the, the field of nationhood narratives, we see a large plurality uh, uh, emerging as, as part of the, the change of, of a generation. And so that was the, the, the kind of concluding aspect of the, of the concluding argument of, of the book. I will stop here and I'm really looking forward to, to our uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, I will now uh, give the floor to Diana Kudabergenova. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for, for this discussion. I, um, I think Marlene gave a fantastic overview of this uh, amazing book. So I'm going to focus on three things. I'm going to talk about the structure of the book and what uh, potentially students can take away from it and, and why they should you know, consider reading this book, especially because it's open access, but also maybe you can get it because it's a uh, very nice, uh, you know, in, in tangible um, format as well. And secondly, I want to talk about uh, the type of contribution that may be connected to the, to the way, uh, to my lens overall work and how much she has inspired this field of post-Soviet uh, nationalism in Central Asia, but also in Russia. And I actually want to specify, and in the second point, I want to talk about the title of the book, which I found very intriguing, um, a little bit shocking at the time, but also I see why why Marlene decided to do this title, in my opinion, in challenging us and breaking these boundaries of knowledge uh, hierarchies that exist currently and in which we all, whether disciplinary or non-disciplinary, are engaged in. And I want to talk about that aspect secondly. And third, I will just think, you know, try to conclude, on, especially on, on the things that Marlene is proposing to do in conclusion, which are very inspiring. I think, um, you know, um, having the, the anniversary of independence, having the anniversary of the collapse of Soviet Union this year, of course, we, we, we consider history differently for, for the West. It's the 1989 and the fall of the Berlin War. Uh, well, sorry, for us in, in the region and actually in what used to be Soviet Union, it's the 1991. And um, for me, I'm coming from Kazakhstan, it's the 16th December of 1991, which is also uh, the final date of the collapse of Soviet Union, but also the Independence Day of, of my nation. So in many ways, I don't think there, there could have been like a better book 
to mark this this 30 years of, of independent 30 years of grand history in the making than the book by Marlene Laruel. And I think she's being very modest by, by calling it, you know, a compilation of her articles. I think looking at this book, even if you look at the um, you know, kind of like um the um contents of the book you can see how structurally well uh it's constructed and it gives you so much to explore and this is like my first point for the students who should uh definitely use this book for for the exploration uh why because the question uh because the book poses very difficult but also very useful questions in thinking about nation nationalism and nation building i think we all are constantly reminded of how and why uh in the post-soviet space not only in central asia nationalism became the dominant ideology and how it became the dominant and uh, signifier of social reality. What I think Marlene is doing is allowing us not only to, I mean, she's allowing us to look beyond that uh, domination and look into why and how this happens. So I think it's a very, very important uh, point for, especially those who are just starting their research, to look into that. Even if you know, you're know you working on a specific country that may not be covered in one of the chapters, you should look at it because the book in the first part is constructed in such a way that it compares Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan, and also uh, focuses on, on, on the specific aspect of Tengriism, which I think should be in dialogue with each other when we're approaching our work. And, um, you know, even if you work, in, for example, in Tajikistan, I think as a scholar, you need to look into diverse literature outside Tajikistan, specifically in the region, to be able to compare and look and, and find the ways of how it's similar or different. So in that way, I think uh, this book is absolutely fantastic to provide the space for dialogue and contestation that we can tease certain conceptual arguments from. Um, and I'll come back about the second part of the book in, in my second point, but also what I think the students are going to be very, and, and anybody who's interested in, in, in doing this study would be absolutely benefiting from, is the way how Marlene has a specific talent in my opinion, I've read a lot of her works, of how she can converge and combine very theoretical concepts, very novel concepts as well, with the absolutely rich and abundant empirical data and i think it's it's it is a talent because you know with the separations and for the coloniality of knowledge when some of us are called the area study scholars just because we're doing our fieldwork in the so-called global south and then being the general universal knowledge producers just because you're doing your fieldwork in the global north uh you know in these conditions and and then with the, with the disciplinarity that is consistently pushing us uh with our like you know with indexes with hirsches with well uh, it with impact factors and where you publish in your work i think it's a very sort of persisting and contested terrain where um, one has to find their own ways of survival so what marlene is doing actually she's going against this by um, writing the book that is very much vested in super rich empirical context but then providing very very much a developed and you know kind of like elegant but also beautifully done uh, theoretical contributions i think this is what i myself even need to learn a lot from from this book particularly to be able to tease out these these concepts and to kind of be able to also um, argue the case that just because it is from Central Asia that is considered a global periphery, it doesn't mean that it's not relevant to a particular literature, be it or nationalism, nation building or authoritarianism. So I really applaud um, to Marlene on that point. Let me come back to part two, which I promised I would do, and it's about uh, politics in Nazarbayev order. And some people might think, you know, why, why is this like that? And actually, I was thinking about it as well, because of course, we know that in Soviet period, it was Central Asia and Kazakhstan. But I think what this book is, is beautifully doing, it's kind of reflecting on what Soviet past used to be and how it has influenced through its legacies, institutions, meanings, symbols, even historiography, how nation building was developed um, in, the, in the first part of its independence, or what I call also post-independence. But it also asks us to kind of like, you know, question that reality in many ways and contest what is Sovietness nowadays in Central Asia and in general in the region. Because I think in order to understand all these debates about what's post-colonial and post-Soviet, what's Sovietness in post-Soviet and so on, we really need to look into Caucasus in Central Asia, and maybe certain parts of Russia that are not very central in order to understand, because when you look in so-called peripheries, that's when this kind of like domination hegemony and power really um, is kind of elucidated. And that's where we need to really look um, sort of methodologically and be innovative in, in those comparisons. So that's, I think, is, is absolutely fantastic. But the fact that Kazakhstan is included as, as a big chunk and second part of this book is also kind of doing justice to the fact that um, despite of the fact that I am from Kazakhstan and, and let's forget it for a moment, uh, I think this particular country and this context has provided so much richness to our understanding of what is the, what can be the new uh, theory or conceptualization of nation building 
or nationalism studies as well, that is absolutely understandable because of the minority issues, because of the linguistic issues that Marlene is so beautifully uh, unwrapping uh, in their complexity, despite of them being like, you know, constantly disent entangled and disentangled in all the social reality. I think that's what's beautiful. And also looking at how the state or regime is using it and how people respond to that through all sorts of contestations is absolutely beautiful. But my point on, on, on Kazakhstan here is also that, um, and that's what a, what a second point of compliment or applauding that I wanted to do to Marlene, is how you are able to take um, the specific case and make it exemplary uh, to the, as, a, as an example of contribution to national studies, and which I hope we all need to pick up and continue building on your shoulders, building on your foundation to do that. Because national studies, in, in many ways, they also need to be decolonized in a way because they do build, as again, in the universalism, they build on the Western experience, they build on the Westphalian European nation state. But what your book is showing that there are there are alternatives to that. There are alternatives both temporal in terms of temporal perspective, but also spatial, and that's why we. Uh, scholars of nationalism actually need to look into Kazakhstan to tease out all these new series and concepts or rethinking the, the, the old concepts that exist. Um, some concepts that I'm really allergic to, like for example, civicness or civic nationalism. If there is such a concept of civic nationalism, I should have put it here in the in the public. And my third point, uh, as I promised, and I think I'm already speaking for too long, uh, but my third point is about the title. It's called Central Peripheries. And I think it's also a very challenging perspective to us, but in many, many positive ways, to think about where are Central Asian studies? Why are they considered as global peripheries? Despite of all the things as Martin said, that you know, Central Asia is being connected to global knowledge production, Central Asia is connected to uh, financial flows. It is literally geographically in the center of all sorts of maps we're looking at. It's in the center, in the heart of Eurasia. It used to be the center of the uh, Silk Roads and all the infrastructures and connections, but due to the uh, post-Cold War you know, divisions of the world, it all of a sudden became the periphery of the periphery because of all these kind of like dominant discourses that then create this hierarchy of knowledge, but also hierarchy in geopolitics. And I think that's something Again, I'm speaking from the sociological point of view. Uh, I know that uh, IR scholars and everybody else would, would have a different perspective and I lo would love to learn it from them. But I think Marlene's book, in a very nice way, opens up that debate even further. So it's beyond just what we know. It's beyond the post-colonial, it's beyond the post-Soviet. But it's more about, you know, teasing out these power relations and thinking why and how we can make this field as dominant as it should be. Because empirically, she proves to us and also conceptually that it is providing so much richness and so much contribution, but somehow it remains on the periphery of certain discussions and certain knowledges. Well, hopefully not anymore because, because you, you've done so much, you've contributed. Uh, but it's also a question for, for, for the scholars who are, you know, currently in Central Asia doing their fieldwork or writing. Why is this like that? Why, um, why, why is our positionality considered secondary or peripheral? And, and I think it's in our hands to change it. I think I had one more point, which, uh, yeah, the point about well, the new studies that Marlene is proposing, absolutely. I think there should be a lot more focus uh, specifically on what and how people feel these changes. I absolutely agree with the memory studies. And thankfully, as you said, there is a breath of new scholarship coming out and we have fantastic uh, studies on, you know, people doing um, memory sort of self ethnographies, auto ethnographies, we call of the post Soviet uh, perspectives, but also generational change, which is very, very important, and how these things are, are changing. So, in many ways, as I said, this book is uh, fundamental um, as, a, as a kind of, you know, marking the 30 years of independence, marking what happened in 30 years of uh, post Soviet, and how are we going to talk about post Soviet in the next 30 years is also a question that is left, um, I mean, inscribed in this book in many ways. But also I think it's um, absolutely fantastic because it provides such a complex, I, I should use better, better language, but uh, such a diverse and all-encompassing perspective on the region that, um, you know, I think it's a must read for anybody who wants to understand how and why it works, um, you know, in the post-Soviet, but also contemporary perspective. And I should stop here because I've been talking for too much. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, for this great assessment of Marlene's book. Uh, and I now turn the floor to Sabina in Sibaiva. Um, yeah, I guess good morning to everyone and good night to those who are in Asia. Um, I'm really happy to see uh, familiar faces and th thank you so much to Peter, to Janet and Caitlin for um, organizing this. this. And um, it is a great pleasure to be able to participate in this event, um, especially because we celebrate 
uh, Marlene's book, uh, whom I consider to be one of the leading scholars in the field today. And speaking of the book, um, I think that it is a truly marvelous book and it's not just like a backhanded compliment. And in the next few minutes, I will give a um, few reasons why I think so. And then I will raise um, a few quibbles just um, in the spirit of this occasion. And I will just ask a couple of questions. So uh, firstly, uh, Mar Marlene's study shows us how um, it is possible to draw many um, interesting insights um, from comparisons, uh, but at the same time um, reminds us that single, single case study analysis um, has a great deal to offer and uh, bring out peculiarities that are often omitted in um, larger studies. And speaking of other studies, I can't help but mention uh, Diana's book that was published earlier this year. And um, while Marlene and Diana's book share a focus on post-Soviet states, um, they actually show little overlap in their approaches and organizing concepts. Um, this is partially due to the fact that Diana being a sociologist and Marlene trained in political philosophy. So these books enrich the debate of nation building from the distinct um, yet complementary vintage points. Um, second, Merlin's uh, book stands out for covering both Soviet and post-Soviet periods, emphasizing that each state's um, post-Soviet uh, nationhood is deeply rooted in Soviet past. So the book offers a broad overview um, of state-sponsored a nation building narratives um, in the Central Asian region and demonstrating how nation building in these states evolved along completely divergent paths. And I think uh, Marlene did a great job um, at synthesizing uh, so much material and dealing with so many controversial issues and put them um, into a broader context. And thirdly, I personally really enjoyed reading about the process of writing and rewriting the biography of each nation. And in particular, Mar Marlene skillfully turned our attention away from the names we all know uh, very well and focus on less known ideologists and writers that actually um, help to shape this grand narratives. And um, I, I came from the book, um, deeply impressed with the detailed research where there is literally uh, no unimportant information. Um, overall, the, the book is a page turner and as Diana mentioned, it is available online and it's not paywalled. So this is a wonderful news for scholars and general audience. And I just want to end with some um, possibilities or suggestions about where this research might go, ne go next. And I think that in the book, as Merlin mentioned, um, there is not insufficient uh, discussion about consumers of this grand na narratives, um, the general population. So, for instance, in Uzbekistan, even though the ruling elite controlled the historical narrative um, that was eventually rewritten, uh, many studies demonstrate that general population felt nostalgic about Soviet times. So. But of course, uh, one cannot be expected to do everything in one book. Um, secondly, while discussing Kazakh, Kazakh case, uh, you mentioned that a transnational paradigm that aims, um, qu quote, demonstrate a path of development that can be adopted by other countries and targeted broader internationalized audience as well as um, domestic ones. So can you please clarify what that means for a regular person in Kazakhstan? For instance, um, if we are to scale down and person personify these paradigms, we can see two individuals, one of whom will identify with Kazakhness and the other one with uh, Kazakhstanese identity. So the first one being someone who um, was raised in Kazakh dominant context and has developed ethnicity based set of uh, attachments and the other one exposed to more um, inclusive informational and cultural environments. So what about th this third paradigm? Uh, who is this person person to whom to what extent and to whom this paradigm was developed? So to what extent does this um, transnationalism resonate with general population for whom 
um, 2030 and 2050 and so on, they actually um, are abstract concepts. Um, my second question is like, while the first two paradigms are self-sustaining, so I have an impression that these two paradigms are self-sustaining, relying mostly on internal dynamics for their own survival. Um, the third one actually requires an external other. So in a sense, um, this narrative was constructed as a way to, uh, to get a validation and recognition uh, of our Kazakh importance or on the uh, international speech in relation to other states. So for example, we're Eurasians, we're proud that 130 nationalities happily live in Kazakhstan and so on. But how important and how resonating is this um, outward looking narrative for their self-identification for um, regular citizens? And my third question um, concerns um, uh, the hierarchy of um, ethnic identities. So. Um, it's not a secret that Kazakhstan nowadays is experiencing retraditionalization and Islamization. So to what extent this, um, the hierarchy of ethnic identities that you mentioned uh, might change in the future? So these are my three uh, main questions. I will stop it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabina. I think there will be some time after Vedic Bol's contribution to actually address these questions from the three discussions, and then we, we move on and open the floor for um, all attendants here. So, Vedic Bol, the floor is yours. We can't hear you, Vedic Bol. No. Yeah, we have a sound issue. Okay, maybe Marlene, maybe you can actually react to Sabina's questions yeah. and to some aspects that uh, Diana brought up because yes. they they are uh, they they go even beyond the subject of the book in regards to scholarship, for example, right? Why is scholarship on Central Asia um, sometimes marginalized? Why and so on, so on. So these, I think, are, are really um fundamental question so so why don't we um let Bidik Bol work on the um technological issue here and and so uh for a couple of minutes uh, uh give the floor to Malen yeah thanks thanks Peter yeah very well maybe you need to kind of disconnect and and come back and it will solve the the issue hopefully yeah they were thank you so much for all your your great uh, uh comments I have several yeah of course it's making me kind of uh uh, uh thinking at, um on the the kind of post-colonial aspect of uh, uh, Central Asian uh, research, which I think is becoming really the very kind of hot <laughs> topic in, in the field uh, uh, globally in terms of knowledge production, but in terms also of this balance of, of, you know, professional realities between those studying Central Asia not living there and those who are based uh, uh, in the region. I think what is it? What I like in the kind of post-colonial framing is that it allows Central Asia to kind of connect with the global South, right? Is that suddenly you could imagine that you would have studies comparing, I don't know, something happening in Central Asia during Soviet time with something happening in, in French-speaking Africa uh, 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 at the same time. And that I think would be something really new for the region because my impression is that for very long, the region was so much thinking of itself and being thought of as kind of linked to the Russian world or therefore or to the Middle East that we kind of lost this possibility of connecting with the, 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 the global South. And I think that will bring a lot. At the same time, I think the risk of the, the kind of too much of this post-colonial framework is that if we push too much the kind of victimization aspect of, of the narrative, first we are kind of taking away the agency that Central Asians had in Soviet time. And I think it's really important and it's it functions for the whole global South, right? To, to realize how much Soviet modernity could be attractive, right? People could be very much navigating a complex world where they knew they were 
forbidden to speak on some topics. They could be deprived of their access to their national languages, some element of their memory. But for a large part of the society, this kind of three drive toward modernization was also very attractive professionally, uh, uh, economically. And I think it's important to find the right nuance and to bring that into the discussion. Otherwise, you make you, you take away the, the agency of individuals and nation, and you also kind of backwardize, uh, if I may say, nation by thinking that modernity is not attractive and cannot be genuine, right? And I think that's the whole point, that modernity shouldn't be only seen as something coming from the West. It's modernity that makes sense for nations in the global South. So I think there, there is a lot of reflection, and I think the fields on the global south more globally is much more developed on that discussion and all the nuances that what we have so far for Central Asia, which are still kind of where it just kind of, the topics is just been arriving these last few years and it still need to be kind of uh, uh, elaborated and brought with, with uh, nuances. And of course it's complicated, it's a different political context. You have Russia kind of retaking control of its own narrative. So you that also create kind of a, a reaction on the on the side of some segment of the Central Asian societies who want to be sure they can keep their dissociation from Russia. But I think the point is that you can be dissociated from Russia and say no to a lot of things coming from your Russian and Soviet past and still embrace some element that Soviet modernity gave you and that you think are making sense for your own nation. So I think that's really where the Central Asian scholarship and societies globally will have to work really on the kind of ten narrow path to find the, the right uh, uh, balance. Sabina, on your comments, I mean, yeah, I think as always in studies on nationhood, the consumer side is always the most difficult, right? The majority of students are always on the producing side because it's easier to study what is centralized than to study how people read uh, uh, things, right? So I think it's also slowly changing. I mean, it, it's slow to change in Central Asia because it's difficult to get to do uh, surveys in several of these countries. It's difficult to really be kind of, you know, attending classroom, for example, and, and seeing uh, how a teacher will divert from what is written in the textbook and say something else. So all these kind of nuanced elements, they are difficult uh, uh, to capture. But yeah, I think the consumer side is absolutely critical and we should bring that back in the, in the picture. And as you were saying, uh, uh, the consumer side has been much more probably nostalgic of uh, uh, some element of Soviet experience that what the official narrative has been trying to to develop and then probably the relationship to Islam and the presence of Islam in many everyday life is also not reflected at all in the state produced narrative. So I think that's the two key elements where you have a gap between the state narratives and what is the everyday life of, of favorite citizens. And I think with what I was saying at the end, this kind of uh, evolution where now state production have on one way or another to take more into account the plurality of voices that are emerging will slowly uh, uh, help uh, uh, rebalance uh, 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 that. Very briefly on your transnationalism question. Well, I think it was, as you said, it's a narrative that is done for export and for speaking to an external order, right? So it's this idea that you will get recognition at home by getting recognition abroad. And I think that has been one of the big strategy of the the, the, of Kazakhstan and especially this, the last decades of Nazarbayev who were really very much kind of inscribing Kazakhstan in the international community and having the reflection of that recognition as the way to legitimize the, the regime at home. But I think it's also a narrative that speaks to the elites, that speak to the new generation of technocrats. And that's a way to say, okay, whatever, either you are more kind of toward Kazakhness or you are more toward Kazakhstanis, whatever, in any case, we are this kind of modernizing country that is showing the past, and that is a kind of model of development the same way like South Korea or Singapore or Dubai could be. And whatever you think about our own internal tensions about what is ethnic, what is civic, we all share this kind of, you know, forward-looking way that make Kazakhstan uh, 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 comparable potentially with all the uh, uh, not great power, but regional power that try to kind of showcase their 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 path of development. So I think that's what the way it was thought by the 
the Kazakh government. And I think it worked pretty well in some technocratic groups for whom that kind of reflection from, from legitimacy abroad was making sense. And last point, retraditionalization, Islamization, as I was saying in the book and in the presentation, yeah, I think that the key issue that the narrative will have to be more nuanced on the, the legitimacy of secular institution, because that will be, at least in some of the Central Asian countries, getting get progressively challenged. And so they will be the, they will have to find a way to reintegrate Islam into the state narrative uh, 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 more visibly, and to find the balance between trying to be globalized and modernized economically and in terms of in visibility on the international scene and the society that is indeed uh, uh, turned toward more conservative values. But I think that paradox is not specific to Central Asia. It's a paradox that we have in many countries in the world. Right, where we have to deal with this wave of conservative or liberal values. And that has to find a way to be articulating with still goals of kind of progress and integration, whatever we, we mean by that. I will stop here and I hope Beric, Beric Ball will be able to, to speak okay. now. Thank you so much, Marlene. And Beric Ball is joining us through his iPhone, so maybe this is going to work. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me now? Hi. Okay, terrific. Yes, excellent. I'm so sorry. There is, I don't know what's happened with my uh, laptop. There is some technical issues. Uh, so, uh, hello, everyone, and uh, hello from Canberra, and uh, good evening, good morning to everyone. I'd like to uh, congratulate Marlene with such a wonderful and fascinating book about uh, nationhoods on Central Asia. And I believe that even so, I read some uh, her articles before on Kazakhstan and I'm using in my current research, I'm finding that she updated and added so much enriched data on that. So I believe it would be useful for everyone. And as the uh, as uh, Diana and Sabina have mentioned, that's, um, that book is uh, in open access. So it will be wonderful that everyone, especially who are in Central Asia, would have access to book and I have, no, I have been happy noticing that it was like almost um, more than 1,000 uh, downloads of the book, especially people from Kazakhstan. And uh, that's really good. And uh, it it's adds a lot of benefit to the scholarship. And uh, I'd like to uh, focus on the some maybe one, two main points on the book that I maybe had a takeaway from the book. And uh, maybe that uh, will be more on the broader implications of this book. Uh, so, uh, my first point is related to this theoretical uh, um, contribution of the book regarding the uh, post-postmodernism and, uh, and how this kind of hybridity or fluidity of the nation building, especially in Kazakhstan, is um, played out in the last 30 years. And I was wondering uh, if, you, if you try to look to this hybridity and fluidity does it mean that uh, th there is a, some kind of impression that this hybridity and uh, fluidity is broadening the gap between the uh, different types of societal dimensions, for instance, in Kazakhstan, maybe, as, as it goes to the language issue between the Kazakh and the Russian, or the ethnic minority, ethnic majority issue, and also regarding the Islam uh, and the uh, um, power elites in Kazakhstan who try to marginal some of the power elites who tries to marginalize this uh, Islam from the as a main discourse in the nation building. Does it mean that this kind of um, this uniting of this gap or the increasing of this gap is kind of um, creating some kind of um, dichotomy and it's kind of creating some more uh, more um, uh, more of a discrepancy in the nation building of Kazakhstan? And it has some kind of more, uh, it, in the long run, it would be more tangential uh, within the Kazakhstani society. And uh, my second main takeaway is related to the uh, further research, and that's related to the, uh, uh, even so the nation building is uh, on Central Asia is widely researched. Marlene provided us more uh, different arenas of the research uh, especially starting from the uh, history textbooks, how it's interpreted and how it's percepted by the school teachers. And my research is focused on that. 
And the first is uh, going on that to the memory studies and how the families would uh, would perceive different traumatic events, for instance, of, uh, of the 20th century as the Soviet past. And uh, also the Islam as one of the areas and uh, going more further into the museums, monuments, and all of that and uh, um, goes to the uh, idea of the that the nation building is moves towards the less state centric as Marlene argued and concluded and uh, um, and more dynamic, more more vivid, more vibrant area because of the including and the changing from the hegemonic discourses towards the, uh, this bottom up approaches. And uh, I believe that that's a fascinating and interesting area, which is goes towards the perception of the and actual consumers, as Marla mentioned. And uh, uh, my research shows that, and it's uh, actually uh, actually confirms Marlene's uh, um, uh, ideas and hypothesis in the conclusion. And it, it's it's actually becoming uh, more. Uh, it, it, it's actually becoming less state centric and uh, I believe that uh, would be a great area of looking at and examining in the future and uh, uh, building on Marlene's research and continuing to do, develop even more further and uh, that would be I believe uh, further work for the young researchers as me to, to work and build on that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Beric Bol. Marlene, do you want to answer right away? Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe I can answer Beric Bol, and then we will. Okay, the and, and let me just say, just to to our to our other guests. So uh, please uh, send your questions through the chat. You can send them to me. You can send them directly to Marlene, uh, whatever you prefer, and then we will discuss these questions uh, when the floor is open to Q and A. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Beric uh, uh, Bol. On the fluidity issue, I really like that notion and I think that many countries in the region are really showing a lot of ideological fluidities more than we want to recognize and maybe Russia is leading <laughs> in terms of creating uh, uh, ideological fluidity but I think Kazakhstan has been also able uh, to do so which also show the, the kind of ad hoc capacity of adaptation of these uh, 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 regimes to the evolution of both the domestic and the, the international or regional uh, uh, context. So way kind of to always negotiate the way you will frame uh, uh, things. At the same time, I don't want to see that as a specificity of the region. I think that in fact, every nation building or kind of citizen citizenship, citizenry contract is always in tension and in flux and in negotiation. And I think what we are seeing now in the West, all this uh, 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 illiberal movement that I'm also studying, I think are also telling us that they want regularly each nation, even in the so-called developed, well-established <laughs> A, a democratic world, you need to renegotiate what is the nation, who is in, who is out, what are the criteria for being part of. That is a normal process just because the world is changing fast. And so what makes us live together and identify as one nation needs to evolve regularly. And I think there is a call now, even in the West, for kind of opening, rediscussing what are the boundaries and, and, and uh, of, of the nation. But of course, the post-Soviet space is showing that in a very kind of, uh, <laughs> under a very bright uh, 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 light. What you said about this kind of growing discrepancy between social groups, depending on, on because of the way the, the, the nationhood is, is developed. I think so. I think in fact for, I think also the nationhood narrative, especially in Kazakhstan, is very much a micro-targeted. Uh, uh, mechanisms, right? That speaking to different audience. So you have different narratives targeting different audiences and saying not exactly the same things or saying the same things, but with a lot of nuances. So everybody can find something that resonates with what they need. Where I think there have been the, the growing gap has been, of course, for Kazakhstan around the, the kind of Kazakh speaking aspect of the nationhood at the same time, I think there are a growing number of ideological products developed by state institution to speak to Kazakh speaking population. It's just that we tend not to see that as uh, foreigners because very few of us 
look at the, 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 what is produced in national languages, and that was my case. I could really look only on what was produced in Russian. So even if I knew there was an entire world in things produced in national languages, it's more difficult to have them uh, uh, studied. I think the key element that is also missing, as I was saying, is the relationship to Islam, and that they will have no way to avoid it, right? It's coming, I think, in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, it's already clear that it has to be integrated. The Kyrgyz society, it's also uh, clearly becoming one central element of the narrative, so it's coming slower to Kazakhstan for a lot of historical and demographic reasons, but it will be there on one way or another in, in the discussion in the forthcoming uh, um, uh, years. And yeah, as you were saying, I think the this rise of grassroots narratives is really absolutely fascinating to, to follow and to see this multiplication of niches who said that they have the right to speak, right? So the nation is not only defined by academic institution and, and state ideology, but by political opposition, Islamic groups, uh, just a, a blogger on social media, maybe also, uh, of course, the voice of the rural uh, uh, population is probably the big missing one as everywhere in, in the world. What will be interesting for Central Asia is the voice of migrants, right? All these kind of transnational communities for whom migration is just the reality, right? So living in Russia or living in other country, how that will change the way they are contributing to the nationhood and kind of deterritorializing a border, but also recreating other kind of links. So I think Islam migration and 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 uh, giving floor to the rural population are the tr three key elements that will make this nationhood evolving quite rapidly in the forthcoming years or, or decades. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malin. Um, I have a question in regards to Kazakhstan. So in your book, you uh, look at four Central Asian nations, but Kazakhstan really has the most emphasis. You, you really focus on it. Why is that? Is, is, does, does it have to do with the fact that Kazakhstan is actually in some ways a real special case based on its wealth, based on the developmental strategies of its president and the men who surround him? Or are there other factors that um, really make uh, Kazakhstan deserving of such uh, particular uh, attention and and will this continue in scholarship in your view is that something that will you know attract more scholars of Central Asia to Kazakhstan rather than um, to other to other uh, republics yeah thanks Peter it's it's a question with multiple uh, uh, layers um, uh, I think one is that Kazakhstan genuinely is a really fascinating case because it had a quite complex national construction with so originally the, the Russian question, then this kind of Kazakhness, Kazakhstanes uh, uh, issue, then the kind of development models that was uh, uh, built. I think it's also depend of what we were able to do as scholars, right? For a long for a decade, two decades, working in Kazakhstan or in Kyrgyzstan was really easier than working in, in Uzbekistan or in Tajikistan. So that also means that we could access more data, uh, uh, do more field work. So, I mean, there have been a lot of things produced in Kyrgyzstan. So I always thought I would bring more to the Kazakh case than to the Kyrgyz case. I think things are changing now because with the kind of partial reopening of Uzbekistan, I think there is a real wave of forthcoming research on, on Uzbekistan that will be emerging and kind of reconnecting uh, with the, the, the fact that Uzbekistan was also the key country studies in the 90s and then it kind of disappeared for two decades and it's kind of re-emerging. So I think it's a combination, but Kazakhstan has a lot of features that are exemplary and a lot of contradiction and complexity and diversity that are exemplary and that were worth to study just, just uh, in themselves. Thank you. There is a question about the future of East Turkestan, Xinjiang. Can you uh, say something about your views of that, that area? Yeah, I didn't see the, 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 the question. It was when sent to me. It was sent oh, okay, to me. Okay, good. Well, so I think the, the Xinjiang is part of Central Asia by so many aspects and should be really studied. And there are great literature and, and uh, great scholarship on, on um, 
uh, uh, Uyghurs. Of course, the, the, the fact that it's not an independent state and that it's part of China is also changing a lot the realities of the nation building uh, uh, construction. There are a lot of parallels that can be done between Soviet time construction in, of nationhood in Central Asia and Chinese construction of nationhood in, in, um, in Xinjiang, highlighting also a lot of differences. But now I think things have really dramatically changed, not only because the post-Soviet ones are independent, Xinjiang is not, but also because the level of repression for coming from China on Uyghur's identity has really kind of uh, 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 reached such a, such a scale that it will be very difficult now for nationhood in, in, um, in Xinjiang to be dissociated from the pressure of the kind of repressive side of the Chinese regime, the accelerated cynicization culturally and demographically, and also it's kind of you know, a, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of relinking, making really Islam as one of the main answer to external cultural pressure and linking nationhood that could be secular. And there are still a lot of secular Uyghur nationalists that are trying to avoid having too much of this kind of Islamic influence. But I think it's a very complex case that will be that has been totally reshaped this last year with the with the high level of, of uh, Chinese repression. Would you say that the treatment of uh, Uyghurs of Xinjiang by the Chinese is kind of a cautionary uh, tale for Central Asian nations uh, in regards to how to deal with China? Because China, of course, is trying to exercise uh, strong influence uh, on the Central Asian republics. Um, but the reaction is rather, I would say, lukewarm and, and lackluster. It's not embraced as an alternative to Russia or to the West. Yeah, I think, I think China has difficulties building its soft power in Central Asia globally, even without the Uyghur issues. It's not easy for China to find cultural arguments to sell itself. Uh, uh, with the uh, repression of Uyghurs, of course, it's making things even more uh, uh, complicated than, of course, in Kazakhstan and globally in the region, but mostly, of course, the, the, it's in Kazakhstan where the situation is the most sensitive. There is among uh, uh, some groups a really growing uh, Sinophobia with this narrative that, okay, look at what is happening demographically. You cannot really trust China at the end, even if we are independent, which is not the case of the Uyghurs there will be a kind of forced uh, uh, cultural, uh, linguistic, demographic cynicization that we should uh, uh, be, be careful of. That said, I mean, I think the interest, especially in Kazakhstan for Asia and for identifi identifying with Asia is growing, but it's not with China, right? It's an identifying with the non-China -Asi non Asia. It can be with Japan, with South Korea, it can be with Malaysia, with Singapore, Right, depending. So Malaysia, if you have a kind of Islamic connotation, then Malaysia is a good example. If you are more on the kind of secular modernity than, than South Korea or, or Japan. And when you look, there is a real soft power of Japan. I mean, Sabina could talk about that, of Japan or South Korea. There is all this kind of uh, Korean pop music phenomenon in, in, in Kazakhstan. So there is a genuine cultural affinity growing, especially in Kazakhstan for Asia, but it's not with China. And I think the government itself also is kind of trying to extract Kazakhstan from the, the geopolitical triangle of US, Russia, China, and saying, let's move to another level. What about South Korea, Malaysia, and Emirates are kind of three ways of development to look at and kind of forgetting the very binary, big geopolitical great power things and looking at the kind of second tier uh, uh, countries. And I think that's that's a great strategy for especially for Kazakhstan to to try to avoid the contradiction of the kind of great power narratives and obsession. You had mentioned Islam as one of the big problem areas for research and how to integrate this also into our analysis of Central Asia uh, nation building. Uh, there is a question about Islamic extremism. Uh, to what degree is that a factor in current uh, uh, Central Asian affairs and how are governments uh, uh, dealing with that? Yeah, I, I don't think Islamic extremism is a, a big issue that, I mean, it has been really emphasized by the Central Asian governments and by the Western actors, but I think it's largely a mistaken view. What is really important and changing 
it's the cultural Islamization of the of difference a different level of Central Asian society. So it's not about extremism. It's about the change of perception, the play of the place of Islam in as an individual identity belonging and also other reference that you can express in the public space. Right. And I think that's where the real challenges will be for the Central Asian government who are still very much based on the Soviet tradition of secular uh, um, uh, institution will be to find a way to give rooms to this uh, expression of Islamic piety in a, a more nuanced way. I think in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, it's already at such a level that there is no way the government can try to deny its existence. Of course, in Kazakhstan, it's arriving um, uh, uh, slower, but so I think the real issue is to look at this kind of peaceful cultural Islamization of mores and of the public space and not at Islamic extremism, which is still a very marginalized uh, uh, phenomenon for, for the region. You're muted, Peter. There's a question from uh, Charles Weller. Charles, maybe you can, you can voice it yourself, would that be okay? It's kind of rather long rather than me reading it, um, if you want to explain it. Otherwise, I might not do justice to it. Yeah, I think we have to unmute. What was the name? Uh, uh, Charles, Charles Weller. Weller. Charles, can you raise your hand, your virtual hand, for example, that would push yes, you Yes, I think you're unmuted list. now. You're okay. unmuted now. Thank you. Thank you, Marlena, and uh, congratulations on another great publication. Uh, and thanks to all of you for hosting this great seminar, a great opportunity to dialogue. And uh, <clears throat> love your book, love your work. So, um, yeah, one of the things that I uh, tried to bring out in 2006 was that elite narratives of nationhood have to resonate with a sufficient measure of the population in order to you know have validity and to gain traction to be embraced right as opposed to just being completely constructed out of nothing for instrumentalist purposes right that is if they're all just sitting around strategizing and uh you know they're working out of a vacuum that's 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 not quite the case so it, it raises these questions as to what extent these elite narratives have been determined and are limited, in, you know, by the population's understanding of who they themselves are and uh, historically have come to be in that way and what the elites can get away with, so to speak, if they're really that, if we're going to frame them as being that instrumentalist, right, in that sense. And then I would understand that to mean that that, that, that um, blurs the boundaries between the elite narratives and the common popular understandings that are in tension, but it's it's kind of this this uh, competition cooperation right that, that is the tension that I understand it there, and to what extent right and what so how we frame that the balance of that. Uh, and then it also raises the question to, to what degree these understandings, collective memory, et cetera, not in a monolithic essentialist way. Uh, it doesn't have to be monolithic or essentialist or organicist in that kind of a sense, but nonetheless, the, the whole question of complex and fluid and, and hazy as they can be and, and even pluralist as these understandings can be amongst different segments of the population, Nonetheless, to what extent is, is ethnic and national identity authentic, uh, grounded in an authentic sense of our human identity, of who we are as humans? And the last note I'll, I'll put on that is that in, of course, you know, racism and race theory, you have the, the swing to the far left that says race is a completely constructed, fabricated, you know, uh, identity. It doesn't actually exist. And yet, African Americans is one of the premier that uh, you know that have been labeled and categorized in this way uh, will certainly uh, affirm and assert their own black identity as being valid and real and, and true and they'll be again you know pluralist uh, competing understandings of what that is but but to deny them that that's a real identity that they are not really have a black identity doesn't really exist it's it's these 
questions, right, that, that um, create these, these complications. And I wonder what your thoughts on these kinds of issues are. Yeah, th thanks, Charles. Really gr great points. No, I, I totally agree with you. You, you, the, the first point of your uh, uh, comments about the fact that these narratives are constrained by also what the society would accept, and you cannot come up with something totally artificial to the nation and hope it will be uh, um, accepted. What I think has been the the, the relationship is that the Central Asian societies have been evolving faster than the state-produced narratives. Right, and that's normal because the state produced narrative, it's by definition, it has its own inertia, it has its bureaucratic inertia, it doesn't want to change too fast. But the Central Asian societies have been changing faster than the narrative. And I think now the state narratives are also trying to catch up with, with this evolution. But yeah, you need, you, you have some cultural constraints uh, uh, that are there and that have to be taken into uh, um, um, consideration. I think that when we look not at the highest state level production and textbook, but more at what is happening, you know, at the local level, the kind of grassroots discussion, the, for example, the few examples we have of discussion about in the cities, which kind of monument to build, how it will be received in the place. We see all these nuances and we see that whatever we want to call ethnic identity for Central Asia, was much more important than what it has been reflected, I think, in the official narrative that was trying to be very cautious both toward Islam and toward uh, some element of ethnic identities. It has been part, and we have great research done on kind of um, folk historiography, right, grassroots historiography on how much, you know, tribes or tribal identity, whatever we put under that term, how it's meaningful in the different uh, context, especially for rural population, especially in, provi in provinces. So I think also the problem with literature on nationhood is that it's uh, uh, state-centric and it's urban-centric, it's capital-centric, and so all the voices coming from provinces and for the rural world are usually not very, very well uh, uh, heard and taken into uh, consideration and integrated. So I think that's that's where also the Central Asian field is an interesting one contributing on the broad uh, uh, discussion on, on what it means, uh, an identity. It's not only uh, politics, it's every before all cultural and kind of embedded in our in the social fabric of our uh, uh, everyday life. And on your comments on, on a race issue, I remember being in in Karakal, Pakistan in the late uh, 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 90s and having a group of uh, uh, European uh, geneticians coming to take genetic uh, uh, footprint of, of the population for a big kind of project, you know, on all these kind of population uh, uh, transformation mobility and people couldn't understand what was the goal and they were like, oh, so you will be able to tell us who we are ethnically very concretely, like if all of us in that village, we are the same or if the other village is kind of genetically different of us, right? So it's just an interesting perspective on how it's difficult for people to, to also negotiate all these kind of race genetics aspect and relate that to what is their everyday life and what are the social boundaries that make sense in their everyday life. Okay, here's a question that addresses this paradox that you mentioned, highly globalized, but also highly traditional. Uh, how do you predict global movements with women's rights, for example, looking at recent protests, LGBT rights, rights of the disabled and so on, will or will not be addressed in Central Asia? How does this complicate your hypothesis of increased social plurality in Central Asia? Yeah, I think so. If we look at the surveys we have, we see a growing polarization around these issues among younger generation. I mean, the majority of the societies in Central Asia at different levels, depending on the countries, of course, are conservative in terms of uh, 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 moral values. And of course, homophobia is the, the, the highest, uh, 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 the forefront of the, the this kind of fight, cultural fights, cultural wars that are also growing in uh, in Central Asia, but globally, we see a retraditionalization of uh, uh, gender relations, right to abortion, uh, uh, right to sex before marriage. So all these elements are kind of really put the Central Asian society's intention, and you have a kind of huge majority for in favor of more retraditionalization, 
and a kind of small urban minority that is more uh, um, uh, uh, liberal. At the same time, you have an activization, you have a local activism that has been growing, I think, in all the big Central Asian city that is really impressive to, to observe. And so you, it's not a good statistic also, right? You can be a minority and still be a very active group and able to, to impact public policy. But I think globally, the region is as moved toward the more kind of conservative agenda. It's also, of course, related to regime security. So if you want to secure your regime, you also have it's easier to push for, in the, the post-Soviet context, to push for conservative uh, uh, values. So I think in the future, all these aspects of, of the cultural war will become much more uh, uh, sensitive. And they also got geopoliticized, right? And that on that, Russia played, of course, a kind of uh, a leadership role in geopoliticizing. So liberal values, gay rights, LGBT rights with association with the West and kind of more conservative values with association, not necessarily with Russia, but at least with autonomy from interference uh, uh, from the West. And so I think that will be a growing field of contested kind of uh, 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 battles, but the global trend is to be both globalized and conservative. So you mentioned differences between urban minorities uh, that hold already uh, more globalized views, uh, modern views, and so on, and then uh, majorities that, that, that resist that. But what about generational uh, tensions? Here's a question I think that addresses that. When you look at you know, the culture of the young generation that is you know, uh, characterized by rap music, uh, by YouTube videos, and so on, uh, there seems to be a strong, innovative push coming from there. It's a very energetic discourse. Um, is there is that generational uh, tension a bit, you know, this, in, in values? Is that uh, really uh, characteristic of, of all Central Asian nations these days? Is it more of Kazakhstan? What is your view on that? Yeah, I think the, the and I'm happy to give the floor also to our three discussants who are all representative of this younger generations of Central Asians, so they can tell even more from the inside. You have generational tensions, but they are not necessarily uh, uh, in favor of the younger you are, you are the more liberal uh, uh, you are in terms of values. You also have the more younger you are, the more in favor of an Islamic identity you are, right? So I think it's much, much more complex that in the younger generation, you have identity or ideological uh, uh, elements that are more visible than for older Soviet generations. So you have a, a kind of growing Islamic constituency. And uh, I don't know if it's growing, but active um, urban liberal uh, uh, minority. That said, I think the, the pop culture produced in Central Asia kind of transcends also this ideological uh, 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 boundaries, you may listen to, to rap music and not necessarily being very liberal <laughs> in terms of your, your uh, gender uh, identity. It's more complicated than that. So I think, yeah, I think pop culture in Central Asia is something that has been really vibrant, not so well studied. It's about music, it's about street art, it's about cinema, it's about miniseries. Right, I think it's it's a very vibrant uh, uh, field. It has contributed to some also yes urban activism, but I would dissociate the the rise of pop culture in Central Asia for the purely ideological orientation of youth, which I think it's more much more complicated with both conservative and liberal uh, uh, groups kind of rising. Uh, Diana and uh, Sabina and Berigbo, do you want to respond to that? If I may, um, yeah, yeah, uh, I believe that uh, I agree with that. We say uh, some kind of um, that we cannot uh, categorize or identify within that one group that younger is more liberal or older more conservative. I believe that what's also an interesting point to look at is this ethnic Kazakhness majority is itself becoming more diverse, is itself becoming more, there are like they are also accepting LGBTQ women's rights, like feminism entering into the like sex education, entering into this Kazakhness field. And also at the same time, there is growing conservatism and uh, like it's a, um, uh, and also the institutionalization of Islam among young people. 
So itself, like Kazakhness feels itself becoming more diverse, more vibrant, and that tries to kind of um, dictate the so-called rules. Huh? And uh, that's where they like, I believe, diversity come from within this ethnic majority or ethnic 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 Kazakhness itself. Yeah. Diana, you are nodding. Do you want to? Uh, I completely, yeah, I completely agree, and I think that's what you know. Marlene and all her answers to basically demonstrate this the, the strictness that that you need to you know follow and, and to see. And I'm always impressed by you know how much you can basically take and, and tackle. But it's exactly it, I think, and I completely agree with Billy Bo as well. Is that there's so much complexity that that our old models, uh, maybe you know, looking at the. I don't know, um, the old ways of top down or even, you know, the uh, understanding of ethnicity, we completely need to rethink it. And um, that's why I also said that Kazakhstan is such a fantastic place to do this right now, because it seems like it's going through, I don't know, some crazy moment of, um, you know, everything is just happening at the same time. And, it, and that's why I also appreciate this, this uh, concept of post postmodernity because this is exactly what it feels like. There are so many different groups that can be gathered in the same place coming from all over Kazakhstan. That's just the city, uh, I mean, just, not just the main city like Almaty and so on. And they might come from, you know, different perspectives and they can be multilingual, dual lingual, but all these kind of like separations that, that used to be very consistent in the 90s between the Russian speaking, precisely only Russian speaking, and then predominantly Kazakh speaking, they're completely getting erased in such an interesting fashion where you can see like, you know, somebody can be speaking in half Russian, half Kazakh, and then the other person will completely reply in, in Kazakh, or they have like this English uh, inserted in, in it. And, I think we need to find like a very uh, distinct language of exploring these uh, ideas and, and just covering this complexity. I can't find even better word for complexity because that's what it is. And I'm always impressed by my land, uh, you know, in this sense of how well you could capture the fact that pop culture is definitely speaking on so many different levels. I think Irina Kairatina in that sense is a phenomenon of its own uh, statute. And I remember when I first you know, came across one of their um, songs, I was really impressed because it's bilingual, it's both Kazakh and Russian, and then their videos are very political as well. And the their audience is very, very much, you know, um, complicated because it can be anybody. And it's not just young people, there are some people who are in their 40s who listen to that, and different people come for different messages that, that they didn't carry out in a sense. Like, you know, it can be the uh, protest against corruption, it can be protest against, lang against language because they do talk about marginalization and uh, kind of like this feeling of being poor, of being ethnicized, being poor Kazakh who uh, both marginalized economically or an urban sense uh, in his identity and so on and so forth. And then, you know, and I think they very, very much uh, playing fantastically in that sort of social fabric and they understand it so well because they themselves come from peripheries, if you want to go like that, from Petropavlovsk, from Skrivnogorsk, in Palatinsk, uh, you know, they don't come from central cities. And I think that's the fact that they can speak to um, not only youth, but also Kazakh speaking, or if you want to go like that, um, you know, uh, more liberal, non-liberal, central, non-central, they popular quite across different audiences. That kind of like, I think, really is what explains Kazakhstan in many ways right now, is that there is unexpected complexity that is, you know, in order to grasp it, in order to understand it, you, you first of all just need to describe it and then try to pull out all these things. So I'm really impressed that, you know, Marlene is keeping her hand on the polls, even though she said she's leaving Central Asian Studies, you still know all the trends and it's absolutely fascinating. I completely agree with you. Yeah, if I can add just one more element of the, the complexity, I think in the kind of the, the Kazakhness, the transformation of Kazakhness is that Russia is no more the external other or the only one, right? It can be China, it can be the West, so it's also kind of the, the place of Russia has just totally changed with this kind of globalized uh, uh, culture that, that make that you can look at Russia being sometimes close to you against the West or China, but sometimes Russia being the, the kind of classic order of Kazakhstan. So I think it's, it's really also fascinating this kind of uh, uh, change of, of uh, uh, identifying who are the others that you have in, in front of you. Yeah. What I also observed myself is that you have the states usually trying to impose linear rules in whatever, in language politics, in ideological, historical politics, but then the way it's absorbed by, by the real people, by, by the population, is very playful and it's not dogmatic. And I think that the same values, I mean, or different values, such as, you know, uh, Islamic values, 
but also uh, values that are expressed in rap music and so on can live in the same person, in the same community very easily because people people don't like dogmatic uh, impositions. They don't like dogmatic rules. And so that that impresses me. The same with, you know, switching from Russian to Kazakh back and forth and back and forth. And in this kind of playfulness, it seems to me Kazakhstan itself um, is actually more uh, advanced than than Russia. And you see in the comments, you know, of Russian viewers to uh, Kazakhstani TV products, how, how much they appreciate this. This is really uh, beautiful. Uh, Sabina, did you want to say something on this topic or? Um, not related to this, but I, I was just thinking like, to what extent the populist forces are still trying to play this e ethnic identity card uh, in Kazakhstan, but actually nobody pays attention to the economic side. So I was wondering what Marlene think about it, because in your previous work, right, a lot about this contract between the government and the population that the you know, Kazakh government provide the population with the economic stability. But but right now we can see that it's not it's not relevant anymore. But still the populists are still playing this Kazakh Kazakhstanis um, uh, cards. But not no nobody actually touched about uh, upon this economic um, stability contract. Yeah, that, that's a great yeah, that's a great point, Sabina. And I think that will be in the future the 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 difficulties of the Kazakh government in maintaining economic progress will of course be a key issue. And then either they will have to partly shift towards something that, as you describe, more, more populist in order to bring identity issues into the discussion so you kind of dilute the, the economic aspect, or there will be forces coming also from more grassroots groups pushing for, for a, a more populist narrative that will be linked to, that would bring voices from this kind of disenfranchised or, or rural population. And I think on many aspects, what we have been seeing all over uh, the US or Europe and or in neighboring uh, Kyrgyzstan, right? This kind of uh, voices of those who consider they were not heard that suddenly kind of got a big uh, uh, push is telling us a lot also about the, the, the difficulties in renewing the economic, the, the, the social contract if economic conditions are not there. And Kazakhstan were lucky for years compared to its neighbor to be so rich, right? And to be able to, to negotiate a relatively easy social contract if economy is on your side, right? Once you lose the economic support, then, then the renegotiation of the contract and the part of kind of identity politics that you want to put in it is kind of uh, evolving quite fast. And Kyrgyzstan is a good example of that, probably. I think we have time for one more question. And here's a real interesting one from a completely different area. How does the return of the Taliban in Afghanistan impact the security of the Central Asian neighborhood? Yeah, I, I think it's impacting directly only Tajikistan security very heavily. The other country, potentially Turkmenistan, I'm not especially worried for Uzbekistan. The border is with Afghanistan is small and well controlled and, and um, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan don't have a border with Afghanistan. I think what will be the key issue, it's not so much the security aspect, it's the kind of symbolic victory of a, an Islamist narrative over the West. And that's the way it will and it is interpreted. And so how much it will contribute to legitimize some Islamist narrative that are not Taliban oriented. Very few Islamists in Central Asia are kind of Taliban oriented. They are oriented toward other Salafi model that looks more uh, prom promising than, than the Taliban one. But I think there will be a kind of ideological spillover of the Taliban victory uh, in Central Asia or in Russia, uh, in the North Caucasus also potentially more than a really kind of security spillover impact, except maybe for Tajikistan, which is in a very specific uh, situation. Thank you so much, Marlene. Congratulations again on this pioneering book. Mm -hmm. Thank you to our three discussions. I think it's symbolic that they come to us today from Great Britain, from Japan, from Australia. I mean, you couldn't ask for a greater geographical diversity, which is also, I think, symbolic of uh, where Central Asia is going, what great potential it actually has. Thank you all for attending this event and uh, all the best to you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.